What's up, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. I'm Jeremiah, but you already know that. Today, I'm going to give you five crappie fishing tips that you can actually use. There's a couple of things out there that a lot of people haven't been talking about that I feel like I'm, that I feel like should be highlighted that uh, nobody else has really gone into, really. A lot of the tips and things that you see on YouTube are about the same old stuff. Now I got something new to add. So I figured I'd share that with you because you guys seem to really like those crappy fishing videos. Crappy, crappy, cyclade, paper miles, specks, speckle perch, whatever you call them in your part of the country. This is gonna help you catch more and bigger fish. Starting with number one, colors matter. Colors really matter. I don't think it can be overstated how much colors matter for crappy. Uh, and a couple of other species out there, maybe walleyes and uh, trout, things like that. But they matter for crappy in particular a whole lot more than I feel like a lot of other fish. And if you look at my jig bucks, I got a custom jig bucks put together. And if you look at these colors, you see a lot of chartreuse, except for right here and over here. Uh, the reason for that is because statistically, chartreuse is one of the best colors. Um, the highest ranked colors, as far as numbers go, uh, as far as what I've been looking at over the past couple of years, it seems like it's black, white, yellow, chartreuse, and blue, which are the most popular colors and the ones that catch the most fish uh, statistically. Green is okay too, but generally those colors or some combination of those colors end up catching the most fish. They do really tend to matter, those colors. And uh, you can't stray away from them. Sometimes you might get one of the oddball orange or pink or something like that. But in general, you normally want to stay somewhere around uh, those particular colors that I had mentioned. And a lot of uh, guides and other guys will actually take their crappy jigs and they'll mix them with three or four colors just to um, get as many as they can because if they don't hit one or don't respond to one or two colors, they'll respond to some of the others. Again, if you look at that box, you'll see, for example, this one's orange and chartreuse, or you have three colors where I've got some white, silver, and chartreuse. One of those colors is going to get bit eventually. And so having a couple of different colors that those fish can choose from, you can get bites out of a fish where if you just had a solid color jig and it didn't want it, you just have to keep replacing the same. You have to keep swapping between colors over and over again. And a lot of guys will also take two and three jig rigs or two and three color uh, um, setups where they have multiple different jigs and multiple different colors and they'll have them on uh, uh, spider rigs or something like that spread out and I have them set at different depths and then they'll find whichever depth that the fish are at and whatever color they want they'll switch all the other things to uh, to match that uh, setup is getting the bites and uh, that's a popular way to go and catch a lot of uh, crappy especially when drifting trolling or when you find a school that doesn't really want to bite you can give them several different presentations at the same time and get them to respond okay tip number two pay attention to the insect hatches um, a lot of people ignore whenever there's a mayfly hatch or uh, another aquatic or semi-aquatic insect that's hatching and a lot of times they'll not be getting bites on their bait fish imitations and on uh, different jigs that imitate small shads and little juvenile fry of other game fish because they're keying in on uh, the dying insects that are flying off and uh, landing in the water. Uh, this is normally something that happens early in the morning or later in the afternoon as the insects are hatching and uh, all kinds of fish, crappie, bass, and uh, pike, and all kinds of other fish alike will actually all be keying in on bait, not bait fish, but they'll all be keying in on um, those insects. And this is the time when the fly fishermen start to do really good, and when the guys throwing hair jigs versus a plastic jig start to do a little bit better. So don't overlook those insect hatches. They can be a really, really great time to catch fish. Um, it's normally one of those things that trigger a feed response in fish, and uh, it's a really great way to catch a bunch of uh, crappie. You'll, come, you'll see them come up and they'll be busting on top. They'll come through and they'll start popping on the surface and you'll see uh, little blow ups here and there. You'll see a whole school in one area and they're eating all these bugs off the surface. You'll see them come up and you can visually see them if you have polarized glasses on. You can see crappies rise up to the top and sip mayflies off the surface. So that's a good time to have uh, hair jigs or a good time if you're a fly fisherman to go by with some sort of dry fly, maybe a uh, 
a stimulator or something like that, they're not as picky as trout are. They're not going to come up and look at it and swim away. As long as it's the same general size and color as the insects floating on the surface, you can get some fish, fly fishing like that. And uh, also some topwater baits will work well for crappie during those times. You can throw little poppers and little rebel crick hoppers, things like that, little hard baits that float. They work really, really good during those times also. So don't be dead set on a bait fish imitation all the time. They do eat other things. They eat leeches, they eat crayfish, they'll, <coughs> they'll eat um, insects and insect larvae, they'll eat um, way worms and things like that too. So don't just always be dead set on a bait fish imitation. Don't ignore the insect hatches, don't, in don't ignore the other forage options that there are out there. You don't always have to go to a minnow every time. Okay, tip number three. This is something that's really cool. I don't think anybody's ever shown you this before, but you can take a jig head, a little light wire crappy jig, but get that to focus. A little light wire crappy jig, and you can take a pair of pliers or just take your fingers, grab it from behind the keeper, and bend it at a 45 degree angle. Okay, so now you've got that. Okay, what you can do then is take a grub, stick it in the head, hook it out, run it up onto the keeper, turn it around, and you can actually Texas rig a crappy jig just like how you would for bass. And that's a great way to catch crappies in really, really dense vegetation and a really heavy cover. Let's, let's say you've got a brush pile and you're vertical jigging and you keep getting hung up over and over again, you're tired of getting snagged. Well, then you can actually Texas rig for uh, those same fish. You can pull them out. Now it does require a little bit more force when you set the hook because obviously now you have to get the hook to go through the plastic into the fish's mouth. So you have to be a lot more sharp on those hook sets. But for the most part, I mean, they have a soft mouth anyway. Uh, you don't have to jack them extra hard like you would on a flipping rig, catching a big largemouth in a grass mat somewhere. You just have to lift pretty sharp and it goes straight through. What you're trying to do is get it to go through here, out there and into the fish's mouth. So yeah, that's a great way to get fish that are in really heavy cover without snagging. It's a fairly snag-free approach. It's not completely bulletproof, but it does save you a lot of time of re-rigging and snagging and having to pop stuff off. And it's, it just saves you a lot of trouble. Crappy fishing tip number four. Don't be afraid to play with size. Uh, a lot of guys will go out and they'll be catching fish on one bait or they'll go out and they'll see them on the depth finder or something like that. Or they'll go into an area where they just know that there's some fish and they're not biting. Don't be afraid to upsize or downsize. Um, you'll be surprised at how big of a bait a crappie eat. Everybody's gone out and uh, sometime or another caught one on a bass lure. Like I, I remember one time I went out with a bunch of buddies, I was throwing a half ounce rattle trap, we ran into a school of white crappies and we just started snatching them over and over again. We just started pulling fish out of that school on a bait that would be too big in most people's opinions. You know, the average copy bait is an inch and a half, an inch and a quarter long, something like that, maybe two inches, not much bigger than that. But you'll be surprised at how big of a bait that they'd actually eat. Uh, a lot of guys will go out in the winter time or in the fall and they'll be ripping a jerk bait a big four inch, five inch jerk bait bass fishing and end up pulling up crappies. So don't be afraid to use a bigger lure. This is actually a three inch curly tail grub and I do really well on that. And uh, by comparison to the average size crappie grub, if you look at one, there is a major size difference between this and that. Both of them work pretty well. They will both work depending on what situation you're in. But especially if you're in dirty water or if you're uh, in a situation where fish are really pressured, it could be it could benefit you to go really uh it could benefit you to go up in size or benefit you to go down in size depending on the situation. Uh things like dirty water where I need more vibration, or maybe if I'm just around bigger fish where I'm trying to upsize the quality of the fish I'm catching, or maybe if you're in a lake that has bigger bait fish in general, let's say that they're eating three, four inch uh, gizzard shad instead of these little itty bitty minnows. Usually it, it would be a good idea if you go to a little bit bigger size bait on average. Now on the flip side, if you happen to be fishing really pressured water or there's a whole lot of tiny bait fish or you catch one and you clean them 
and there's a little bitty bait fish in the stomach to those crappie, you can go down to a one inch grub. Something really tiny, something small, sometimes even smaller than that. Or if they happen to be feeding on fry, that'll be another good thing to do. Um, crappie are one of the biggest predators of the fry, the, bit, the hatchlings of other fish. So you can downsize and use a tiny little grub or a tiny little jig, or even those ice fishing jigs, the little uh, tungsten ice fishing jigs with the little bitty short shank hooks on them, and the tiny little plastic trailers. Those work really good in situations where the fish are extremely pressured. So if everybody's crappie fishing and they're hitting them extra, extra hard, you come out with a much smaller jig on a much lighter line, four pound test, two pound test even, on a micro light rod and that itty bitty jig can sometimes coax fish to eat that wouldn't have hit otherwise. And the last thing, tip number five, Crappie school by size. The reason for that is simple. All right, why? Well, they school by size because fish of the same size can't eat each other. Okay, so if you're in a situation where you're catching a whole bunch of small ones, they're only, let's say, six, seven inch crappies, you're really better off just upping and moving and finding another school as opposed to sitting and trying to catch bigger fish out of the one that you're in because they're all gonna be about that size. Um, if you go into a school and you're catching 10 and 12 inches, you're good on you. They're pretty well off in a situation like that. And you just probably shouldn't move. If they shut down, you can switch colors or you can switch sizes or something like that that I mentioned earlier. You can only pull a couple more fish out of school, but it's good to establish a milk run of spots and just bounce around until you find the quality of the fish that you're looking for, instead of staying in that one particular area and catching a bunch of smaller size fish because they're all gonna be just about that size. There's gonna be an occasional good one out of a bunch, but for the most part, they're all going to be around the same size. So you should really just leave them alone, find yourself another school, and go on from there. Here's one more. This is a bonus for you. This is for all you guys that go out in the uh, wintertime or after a cold front, a post frontal day or something like that. You go out, you find fish on your uh, sonar. I'm going to tell you how to, fin how to find fish, how to tell fish that are active versus ones that are inactive on sonar. Let's say you go by a bridge. You go by a bridge at the mouth of a creek on your favorite lake, and you see a school of crappies, and they're clustered tightly around the pilings of the bridge. Or maybe you're on the way off in the main lake, you're at the end of a point, and you're sitting on top of a brush pile, and all of them are tightly clustered around that brush. Odds are you should probably leave those fish alone. They're probably not active. You may not catch them. You can leave and come back at another time. Most of the times they'll still be there. They may hang there for days at a time, so long as other needs are met and they have bait fish in the area and easy access to deep water, they'll hang around there and they won't move. But odds are, at that particular time, those fish are not very active and you're probably not going to catch them. What they look like on sonar is, it looks like a Christmas tree, just about, on that brush pile. You'll see, you know how a Christmas tree is sitting on the bottom and has all the uh, branches spread out, you have all the ornaments hanging on it, stuff like that? You'll start to see that. But if you go in, uh, but in a situation where you go out, you find those same groups of crappies and you see them spread out, kind of scattered around the outside edges of it, and they're kind of suspended above it or around it, those are fish that are catchable. Fish that are clustered tightly to cover are a lot less active than the ones that are roaming around the outside edges of it. Those fish are all lot more active and they're moving around and they're looking for food and uh, oftentimes you can trigger those fish to feed. Sometimes if you get into a situation where they're clustered tightly around cover and you pull one out of the school, you can trigger the school to feed, but it's rare that that happens for crappie. It does happen for other species like say white bass or stripers or something like that. You pull one out of school, you fire them up, they start biting crazy spotted bass, they're laying down there on the bottom, they're not doing anything, you wiggle a drop shot in front of him, you stick him, he comes up, and then he brings his buddies with him. That happens for those fish. Crappies, not so much. So, if you uh, come across a bunch of fish and they're clustered real tight together, and they're kind of low to the bottom, especially in the, if there's a lot of cold weather, they're not really looking to feed, and you may or may not catch them. And if you do catch them, you're gonna have to really work for them. You're really better off just going someplace else and finding an active school. All right, that's all I got for you today. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you can use that information to catch yourself some more and some bigger fish. Um, stay tuned, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell notification so that you can see when I come up with more videos. Get order some more crappie fishing stuff, maybe some cat fishing stuff, uh, some bass, some salt water, some fly fishing maybe. I got a whole bunch of information to put out there. So I'll take care, I'll see you next time. Thanks for the view, bye.